Pao. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Clive Wormsley, and I, I'm from uh, Natural Resources Wales, where I uh, lead our work on climate change, uh, which is very diverse from uh, reducing our own emissions as an organization, but encouraging others to do so, but also understanding the uh, huge array of impacts on, that climate change is having on the natural environment of Wales and, and how we tackle it. And I've been involved in the Cherish project from more or less from its outset uh, and have been a member of the advisory uh, board of the, or panel of the project. And um, I think you'll have already seen a great diversity of um, uh, illustration of, of the work that's happened within the project. And in this session, the second session, which is entitled Living with Change, which I think is a good strap line for the project as a whole in terms of what we need to take from the, the project. Um, we've got four um, diverse speakers to, to come. And uh, before we do that, I'd just like to say that we are going to have another Slido quiz. And I think over to Hugh. Are we going to kick that uh, Slido quiz question out there? Hopefully that's happening as I speak. Um, so just a couple of practical points which uh, I think have been mentioned. One is if everybody can switch their phones off, um, but obviously, um, well, when I say phones off, put them onto silent. Um, and you can, you can submit questions through the Slido, as, you all, as hopefully you all know, but we will also have, have got the roving mic and you can uh, stick your hand up once we get to questions at the end. So I think that's all I need to say by way of introduction. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, Sarah Davis, who's from Aberystwyth University, for the, for the first uh, presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, it's, it's really nice to, to be here and to be able to present the culmination of, of uh, six years of hard graft on the uh, Cherish project. And we've heard um, a little already about, um, about the storms that we've experienced during the course of the project, but what about the record of past storm activity? And we see that evidence in the landscape all around us, whether it's submerged forests, whether it's storm deposits on beaches, or whether it's sand dunes on cliff tops where we might not necessarily expect them to be. So we've got this geomorphological record of past storm activity and climate change. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, the team at Aberystwyth University, is to develop the longer term context of climate change so that we can put the, um, the current challenges and future challenges that we're facing within a broader understanding of the nature and timing of climate variability over millennia. So we've been taking sediment cores from a, a range of different locations around the coast of Ireland and Wales, and we're trying to develop broader scale records of climate change over millennia, but also focused on the record of past extremes. So those episodes of increased storminess. We're using those records in a range of different locations in different kinds of records to help us understand about the, the longer term evolution of coastal landscapes that have occurred against a backdrop of climate change. And you've heard from Jeff already, who's mentioned the importance of chronology. We can't understand the record, we can't look at um, rates of change or, or timing of change without having um, a, a robust chronolo chronological framework. And we've used a range of different coring techniques in different kinds of environments, coastal lagoons, peat bogs, even um, on beaches, um, to, to retrieve our sedimentary archives. We've now got over 130 metres of core in our collection from around the coast of Ireland and Wales. And we've built up a big database of radiocarbon and luminescence dates, as well as some dates um, from lead to 10, um, which, which um, covers the most recent past. Every core that we've collected has had initial core descriptions, photographs, it's been logged. Um, and we also have a geochemical and, and magnetic record of change for every single core that we've taken. And then some of those cores have been followed up with more detailed paleoecological analysis, particularly pollen and diatoms. I would just like, while I'm on these slides here, Patrick Robson appears in all of these slides. He's been integral to our paleoenvironmental um, work on Cherish. Um, he's, he's really driven the, the field work, the logistics, the laboratory analyses, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Patrick for all the efforts he's done in 
he's made in, in pulling the team together, but, but, um, but really his work has really underpinned the, the excellent data set that we now have. So, of course, we've lived with storms throughout history, and we see that record um, in documents, diaries, newspaper articles, paintings. And so we have a, a, a sort of rich historical narrative of storms. And one of the areas that we've been working in, um, in uh, southwest Anglesey and, and, um, and Gwynedd, um, and you've heard from Jeff already about the work at Morvedintle and Dinistintle to the south of this um, image here. The historical narrative here has been one of medieval storm activity. There are historical archives that indicate there's big storms in the 13th, 14th century. But what we wanted to understand with the paleoenvironmental record is can we extend that record back further? Can we, can we um, add some more detail to this? So I'm going to take you to um, Llyn Coron, um, first of all, which is up here, and it's a, a small lake which is impounded by an extensive dune system at Abba Frau. I'm going to talk a little bit about Llyn Mylog a little further to the north. And at Llyn Coron, we retrieved um, a two and a half meter sediment sequence, and straight away we could see there was evidence of some fairly extreme episodes of change in that core. We've got two um, uh, 10 centimeter thick sand layers here, which indicate periods of, um, of um, more dune activity and sand mobilization that's being deposited in, into that lake. Our initial assumption there was that this would be related to that medieval period, that, um, that sort of 14th century, 1330 um, storm. And this was the prevailing narrative previous luminescence work had identified that uh, there was significant storm activity at that time. But actually, when we um, look at the sediment core record, we have a much longer history of, of um, episodes of extreme um, storm activity. The record extends back... Um, over 3,000 3, years, and we've got at least five periods of storm activity, some of which are visible in the stratigraphy. We can see clear sand layers. Others um, uh, were actually much, much finer, but, but once we look at the geochemical record and relate it back to the core stratigraphy, we could see um, a, a clear record. So we have um, some major phases of sand, uh, storm activity, and the sand dune deposits that, are, that I showed in the previous slide are dated to 540 AD, and to uh, 160 BC, and that's using luminescence dating. This calls a really nice example of where we've been able to join together luminescence dating and um, radiocarbon dating and, um, and produce a, a nice sequence, which thankfully is all in order. A little bit further north, we also examined um, this coastal lake here, coastal lagoon here, Llyn Mylog, which today is a freshwater lake. And our assumption was that, given that we were working in fairly close proximity to Flincoran, that we would have similar kinds of records here. Actually, we got quite a different sequence, extending back um, 12,000 years. And within that, we have over a metre of marine sediment. Um, the marine sediment is, is clearly identified with, um, with um, shell um, uh, uh, trace fossils here. And that, um, that marine incursion began around seven and a half thousand years ago and is also linked to the age of submerged peats on the foreshore that were also dated to around seven and a half thousand years ago. So we've got a, a nice sequence building up of landscape evolution in the area, but also that extreme activity. We don't have a record of storm activity from Llyn Mylog. And this is the, the sort of broader paleoenvironmental record. We've got marine diatoms in our marine incursion. And it's been a freshwater lake for... Um, at least the last five and a half thousand years. So the record of sea level change has become quite an interesting uh, area for investigation for us. And um, just down on the southern side of the Thleen Peninsula at Abasoch, you've heard about the hoof prints that were discovered by our colleagues earlier in the project. Um, these are dated to around 4,200 years ago. But there's actually two peat deposits. Um, the upper one is where the hoof prints are found, and there is a lower one only visible at very low tides um, dated to around seven and a half thousand years ago. So we're picking up that consistent timing of, of sea level change around the coast of North Wales. Patrick also had the idea of coring through the beach to get a three metre sediment sequence and between the two peats is uh, uh, another um, section of marine sediment which is full of marine diatoms. And so what we're building up is a picture of more complex 
sea level change combined with um, storm activity and being able to look at multiple sites on a landscape scale has really been quite a powerful um, uh, part of, of Cherish. Moving over to Ireland, we've taken a similar approach down in County Kerry in Ballinskelligs and um, Ballinskelligs Abbey is here. We've got a six and a half thousand year paleoenvironmental record from the wetland behind the abbey, but we have also been able to explore um, some sites to the northern part of the bay as well. And there we have an extensive peat bog, Emla Moor, which, um, which is actually exposed um, on the beach at uh, Reen Row Strand. You can see the peat stratigraphy here. So we've been able to take cores from um, the, the intertidal zone, from um, just behind the beach, and also from the main bog itself. We have... Um, evidence of submerged forest. These um, tree stumps are dated to just over 4,000 years ago. And there's evidence of submerged archaeology as well. So we're trying to build up this integrated picture of the paleo environment, the archaeology, extreme events, and sea level change. At M. Lamour, we have a continuous sequence that takes us back over 6,000 years. And this is one small fragment of the bog which hasn't been disturbed. So there's an element of rescue paleo-environmental work here. I'm not sure how long that, um, that, uh, that untouched part of the bog is going to remain um, un uncut, so we have a, a, a good sequence from here. And we've used the bromine record. A bromine is a marine aerosol, so it can give us an indication of sea spray. And all of these peaks here indicate um, uh, increases in, in marine aerosol activity when we correct for organic content. And the record that we have here of, um, of that sea spray content is really quite similar to another paleo-environmental record that we have from over in, in Wales at um, Cors Vochno at Borth Bog. So we're able to start link making linkages between our sites, not only within a landscape unit, but across um, the Irish sea zone as well, which is, which is really exciting. And at Emla Moor, we've also, uh, we, we also um, got a, a, pay, a pollen record um, which has given us some insights into the development of the bog. We've got um, pine here, which is, is dated to around the same time you see the pine on the foreshore. We've got evidence of human activity with plantago present um, throughout, but increasing in the upper part of the core. And intriguingly, we also have the presence of some walnut, um, which is dated to the medieval um, period, and whether that relates to um, the activity at the Abbey is a, is a question. It's only tiny amounts, but it's an intriguing question there about when, um, when those kinds of um, uh, you know, um, resources were, 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 were first used here. So, so as always with these kind of projects, sometimes we get more questions um, than, than answers. But... Hopefully these two examples from, from Ireland and, and Wales have shown you the, the power of being able to investigate multiple sites within a landscape unit and multiple types of record to try to piece together different parts of the jigsaw puzzle. So overall, I think we've been able to identify new information on sea level change. We think we have a more complex record and evidence of a, a high stand around seven and a half thousand years ago, but there is clearly more complex sea level history to be, um, to be investigated in that intertidal zone. We're starting to build up a coherent regional picture of storminess and sand inundation over the last three to 4,000 years, extending our understanding back beyond that medieval period, which, um, which is quite well known um, around the coasts of, of Ireland and Wales. So altogether, we're building up a, a picture of landscape history and stories to tell about individual places. The paleo-environmental records are quite localised, as we've seen. These places are important to people, so these stories are important for communities in learning about the history of their past and the previous communities who lived in that location. And I think they also provide powerful stories to remind us that the landscape has always changed. These landscapes are relatively recent, and they have always been changing. Okay, we're facing really major challenges now, but we need to think about our future choices in the context of our understanding of that longer-term dynamics um, that, that we see in, in the, in the paleo-environmental record. So these, these stories, I think, are quite useful both for communities but also for policymakers and for, for those who are involved in managing these precious sites around the coast. Thank you very much. Jochen Bauer.
Thanks, Sarah. And um, we're going to now move from the kind of paleo-environmental record uh, to Sandra Henry, from, uh, well, who worked for the Discovery Program as part of the Cherish Project and is now working for the National Monuments. And uh, we're going to move on to the, uh, the commentary talk. Good afternoon, all. So I'm just going to talk about the work that was undertaken on Ferreter's Promontory Fort, and I'm going to focus in particular on the excavation. Um, so Ferreter's Promontory Fort and Castle site is located on Dune Point in County Kerry on the Dingle Peninsula. It's over 500 metres in length, and um, it is really commanding views over to the west, to the Blasket Islands, and then to the south over Slay Head, to the north to can say civil and um, then also to the east towards Smirk Harbour. So the site was first recorded um, quite substantially by Westrop. He recorded the defences of the site at the start of the 20th century. Uh, Claire Cotter undertook a survey of the site as part of the Dingle Peninsula sur um, survey in the 1980s and then Cherish initiated work on the site in 2017 when the project was initiated. So here we can kind of begin to understand the erosion that's happened on the site over the last um, 120 years or so by having a comparison of the second edition map with our digital elevation model from 2021. Here in particular, we can see certain areas of erosion, such as at the western tip of the promontory fort. We can also see all along the side cliff face and um, that the promontory suffered quite substantially from erosion. Also along the defences, uh, we see a number of areas of erosion and then there's a number of spots of erosion also along the north face of the promontory fort. We also did a cloud comparison between our 2018 and our 2021 data sets in order to um, be able to understand the change that was happening throughout the course of the project. And here we were able to identify a number of areas of change. Again, um, along the defences, here one of the hut sites at the western tip of the promontory fort, and along the south cliff face, we also identified erosion. So to kind of understand how substantial the change is, um, if we compare Claire Cotter's plan from the 1980s, we can see what appears to be the most substantial hut site on the promontory fort um, is enclosed here in this red uh, polygon. And then we have the same hut site enclosed in this polygon in the digital elevation model of the site. And we can see um, where the hut site was once located in from the cliff edge. And um, it's now only partially um, present. It's, suffered hugely from collapse. We only have partial remnants of the eastern extent of the hut site. Also, we can see uh, through a comparison of the first edition map and the second edition map, um, the extent of change that has happened at the western extent of the promontory fort um, and how part of the western extent of the promontory fort has now become isolated from the mainland. So just a number of examples of the type of erosion that's happening um, to the archaeology on the promontory fort. We can see here a masonry wall. It's only visible via um, the cliff edge surveys we undertook via drone and boat. Uh, erosion here, it's not identifiable in the field. Uh, it's probably associated with the, the 15th to 16th century castle on the site. Here we can see what is potentially a hut site is eroding off the north cliff face. You can almost see the depression just here. Um, this hut site hasn't been recorded by the previous surveys and by looking at the OS maps, um, we, can probably, um, we can probably see that uh, the erosion to this site has happened since the 19th century. So we undertook walkover survey of the site and we identified over 40 uh, sites of archaeological significance or potential along the headland. Um, we also, with all the different survey methods we employed, we probably identified well over 50 sites. Um, here we can also see um, through the, the location of the sites on the south cliff face, the extent of erosion that's happening, also in particular here at the western tip of the promontory fort. We can see a concentration of sites along the north cliff face as well. 
So we undertook geophysical survey um, where we completed a magnetometer survey of the entire headland due to magnetic interference so the data wasn't usable. But we had four target areas for resistivity survey and they produced really interesting results. So for example here we were um, able to map the extent of archaeological features eroding off the cliff edge that weren't necessarily visible on the surface. In all the areas, we identified features of archaeological potential. What's worth looking at here is this sub-rectangular enclosure with associated semicircular and circular features just inside the inner rampart wall of um, the inner defences. It is located um, centrally to what seems to be a one-metre gap in the rampart wall and maybe part of um, a more complex entrance way, but obviously we can't discern this and um, that could be associated with the promontory fort. We also identified a number of features associated with the castle and um, potentially um, a sub-rectangular structure here denotes um, a hall associated with the ca castle. But the excavation itself to focus on a, on a hut site at the western extremity of the promontory fort, this was identified as appeared to be the most substantial hut site on the headland and alongside this um, it was located in from the cliff edge so um, it, it just provided a safe place of work. So here we can see one of three plans of the site that were created during the two weeks of excavation of the site and um, this is the final plan that was cre created and it's um, the excavation depth was reached um, by during the period of excavation. So here we can see um, the entrance way to the hut site. Here is our eastern qu quadrant. Um, all the quadrants are named after the cardinal points in which they're orientated towards. In this quadrant, we only removed the topsoil and the subsoil in order to expose the hut site structure. In the south quadrant, um, we excavated to quite a substantial depth uh, one relative to the, the north quadrant. Here we identified that the walls of the hut site had been robbed out and we were able to identify here the bank against which these walls were built up against. Um, in the west quadrant we can see a context uh, which contains material that belongs to the structural collapse of the hut site. And in the north quadrant we, um, we were able to expose some medieval layers of activity and a flagstone entranceway. So if we look at this image up here, this is the eastern quadrant where we focus on cleaning, cleaning up the area around the entranceway. We can see the depth of the hut site walls and we can see quite a defined entranceway. We also have this um, large slab located at, over the entranceway. So potentially it acts as an entrance slab although pr probably a more likely interpretation is that the lentil, lentil stone above the entranceway. Um, this has been kind of substantiated through the location of it and also the dimensions of the entranceway and the slab. Um, the earliest activity we identified on the headland is represented by this cup mark stone. It's early Neolithic, ne late Bronze Age in date and it was reused within the hut site. And then here we can see one of the section faces. Uh, this shows over 60 centimetres of material of collapse within the hut, um, from the hut site structure. So the basal deposit that we identified through coring was Iron Age in date. It was an early Iron Age date. The structural collapse that we dated, uh, we got a date for the, for the early part of the first century AD, and then we got a later Iron Age date as well. So this indicates to us that this subterranean dwelling was dug out at the start of the Iron Age and potential, um, by the first century AD, the type of structure that's present on the headland now is what was present on the headland, if, if not beforehand. And then with the later Iron Age collapse, we have indications of usage of the hut site throughout the Iron Age. So the hut site itself is it, internally it's rectangular uh, we can see robbing out completely off the structure here the external area of the hut site is also rectangular with chamfered edges 
And um, here we can see a drone image of the final stage of excavation. Here we've, we encounter medieval phases of occupation. So the latest medieval phase of occupation is dated to the start of the 12th, end of the 11th century AD. And then we had an earlier phase of occupation that was the start of the 10th century, um, or sorry, end of the 10th century, start of the 11th century. No, sorry, yeah, no, so, yeah. And so that date's quite interesting because it correlates with the dates that were uh, obtained for Dunbeg, Promontory Fort, and the clock and it there. So this area in the West Quadrant had a stratigraphy that correlated to the North Quadrant and actually was an area which produced quite a large quantity of um, animal bone. Here we can see Patrick and Sarah undertaking coring at the hut site. And here we can see um, the charcoal that produced the early Iron Age date for the hut site. It's really interesting. Um, this was about 14 centimetres below the excavated levels that we achieved in May. And it'll be further excavation will be interesting to understand how the later medieval activity impacted the earlier activity in the hut site. Uh, Sarah and Patrick also cored the inner ditch of the hut site, which returned a date from the 8th century um, AD. And this was really interesting as the core obtained hearth material and so showed the later use of the inner ditch of the hut site for um, perhaps for shelter or something. But this uh, also is a phenomenon that was found on the excavation of the promontory fort at Dawkey Island. And then our other area focused on for the excavation was the outer ditch. Here we established a lot of the activity associated with the later use of um, the outer ditch of the promontory fort associated with the castle. We see a later medieval cut. The deposit below this was dated to the mid 16th century. And what we see here is a cut and a number of deposits that predate the later medieval reuse of uh, the outer ditch. This may be, initial, this may be associated with the initial um, building of the, of the outer ditch. So we identified a number of features in the outer ditch. For example, we have this stake hole here that was cut into the, the 16th century deposit um, that we dated from the ditch. We can see it's sealed by the later infilling of the ditch. And then we have a number of other features, such as hair, which may be associated with the earlier activity in the outer ditch. We can also see that a lot of the infilled material appears to be from the castle and also from um, the inner ditch. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks. Sandra. <clears throat> so without further ado, we'll, we'll, um, we'll move on from the, uh, the, the work on, on land, on the uh, promontory fort. We're going to move to the marine environment and uh, Alison James, who from, who's from MSDS Marine. Thank you. Thank you. So in 2021, MSDS Marine were commissioned by the Cherish Project to undertake a programme of diving on the Bronze Bell Protected Wreck Site. And I was lucky enough to be the MSDS Project Manager. So that's why I'm here to talk to you today. But whilst previous project work by Cherish had really included marine geophysics and looking at the seabed in that way, our project represented their work being taken underwater by diving archaeologists for what I think was the first time in the project. So the wreck itself is located very close to shore in North Wales. It's a lovely site. It's in about 10 metres of water. And it had first been discovered in 1978 by local divers. It's sometimes called the Tallybont wreck um, due to its proximity to the village of Tallybont. But it's perhaps more famously known as the Bronze Bell wreck due to the beautiful bronze bell that you can see in the image there um, that was recovered by divers on the site during the early days of their excavation. You might be able to just see the date on the bell of 1677. 
we think the wreck um, itself dates to 1709. There's an 18th century map which records a wreck at that location, and it's got a date written on it of 1709, and it says the wreck contained paper and marble um, as the cargo. And indeed, the cargo that we see on the seabed is indeed marble. Um, there's a whole range of marble blocks from 80 centimetre cubes right through to sort of three metre long sort of rectangular chunks of marble. If you visited Barmouth, you may have seen this sculpture here. Um, it's on the quay, and it's carved from marble that was recovered from the wreck, um, and it was carved to celebrate the millennium uh, by a local sculptor. The wreck itself is designated under the Protection of Wrecks Act 1973 on account of its archaeological significance. Today's session is about ambition, about delivery and legacy. Um, so let's start with the ambition or the aims. Cherish tasked us with completing an updated survey of the site using both traditional underwater survey techniques and photogrammetry, as well as undertaking a baseline assessment of the site to enable the effects of climate change um, on the wreck to be better understood in future. It was also really important to the project, uh, both for Cherish and for us, that there was a programme of public engagement and outreach. Um, public engagement is, is critical, especially on these underwater sites, and we find that people are always fascinated by shipwrecks. Um, and as archaeologists and divers, we're lucky enough to be able to go underwater and see them. But it's really important that we share what's beneath the waves um, and out of sight of many people with a wider audience. So that was built into the project from the start. Hopefully my video will play in a second, it might not do, um, but if it does, we were very lucky to have an excellent team for the project, and you can see some of them here. Um, we had diving archaeologists, we had photogrammetry specialists, we had diving tracker op tracking operators, um, through to the video production team, and underwater camera woman we had with us on the project. Um, if I had sound, you'd be able to hear some fantastic A-team music, but I decided that was probably a bit much for today. Yeah. The, <laughs> the last contractor to visit the site um, was Wessex Archaeology back in 2004. And two of our dive teams, so Jenny Kent and Simon A.D. Davis, had been part of that team. Um, and that really helped us to enable cha to look at changes to the site because they'd had eyes on the site and been there 20 years previously. Prior to fieldwork, um, the most recent multi-beam survey of the site, which had been undertaken by the Cherish project in 2020, was geo-referenced and loaded into the project's GIS. And that allowed us to create an updated site plan um, to be created in advance of fieldwork that our divers could then ground truth when they were on the seabed. Um, the site plan here shows the multi-beam, and you've got the multi-beam underneath with the Wessex Archaeology 2004 site plan in red, with our updated site plan on top in sort of the slight bluey colour. Diving was all taken on scuba, and we were able to get three teams, of three teams of two divers in a day, which gave us well over six hours' time on the seabed, which might not sound a lot, but for a maritime archaeology project is, is pretty substantial. Um, as you can see in these photos, we were blessed with beautiful sunny weather. And whilst sunny weather definitely made for a better project, it was challenging because um, you've got challenges of keeping your divers hydrated, especially when you've got them, like Jenny in this photo, sat in their kit um, ready to get in the water. So it was just something extra for us to have to think about. We used a sonodyne tracking system to allow the topside diver to communicate with our divers on the seabed to, to direct them to where they needed to be. The 2004 Wessex Archaeology visit had achieved some really good photos at key points on the wreck, um, and we wanted to identify the locations that, and the directions in which they were taken. Um, and if you look at the site plan here, you'll see a series of yellow arrows. You might just be able to make them out there. Um, and they show the location and the direction the 2004 photos were taken in. And once on site, the team were tasked with visiting the locations and repeating the photographic survey. Photographic survey, sorry. The topside supervisor was able to use the tracking to make sure they were in the right place and to guide them. And in this photo, you can see one of our divers, I think it's Tom, with laminated copies of those photos, identifying the position to, to physically take that photo. Um, and this image shows you the diver tracking. So that, that each single line is a line that one of our divers took during the dive during the course of fieldwork. So we got quite good coverage of the wreck. So how did it go? Well, it was quickly apparent that visibility on site was nowhere near as good as 2004. Jenny and Simon, who were part of that 2004 team, were able to confirm this. Here are two of the many cannon on the site. On the left uh, is the Wessex archaeology photo from 2004, and on the right is the 2021 photo. So you can see the differences quite clearly. 
If we look at another photo, there's three further guns um, in these photos, you can see dramatically more marine growth. If you look really closely in the top right of the 2021 photo, you'll see a yellow round tag, and that was a survey tag installed by Wessex back in 2004, so it was nice to confirm that their survey tags were still in place. And finally, a single gun, and it's immediately clear that the amount of marine growth um, is, is so much different. Now, some of that's due to time of year. Wessex visited in May, we visited in the September, and there's always going to be more marine growth later in the year. Um, in addition, the two people who'd been there before were able to confirm that um, in 2004, to enable the features to be recorded, a lot of the marine growth was removed. But as a key objective of our work was undertaking a baseline record of that marine growth, we didn't remove any of it. But the photos will really be a key record of the site in future, and it's hoped that future contractors and dive groups who visit will be able to record the same features to monitor change over time. So we developed an accurate site plan. Um, you can see it here. The multi-beam was used as a base map, um, and ground truthing by the divers allowed us to make sure that cannons were orientated in the right way and that things were in the right places. We identified a number of new archaeological features, including um, there's a concretion of at least four rings on the seabed between the two um, anchors that you can see. They're each approximately 23 centimetres in diameter, but we have no clue what they are, and it, it, was, it was quite an interesting thing for us to spot. Um, you can see here, there's, there's the ring features, there's just a photo of them. So divers undertook a photogrammetry survey of the wreck. You can see there's a lot of weed growth um, on the site, which is a real challenge. For those of you who do photogrammetry, you know the last thing you want is something moving. Well, this marine growth is moving backwards and forwards constantly, so it's very much a challenge, but you can clearly see the marble blocks on the seabed. Um, there's a huge mound in the middle of the site, and you can see things like the uh, anchors up here and the ring feature you might be able to spot. In line with the aims of the Cherish project, we wanted to understand climate change and the effects, if any, it was having on the site. And to this end, the team undertook a baseline assessment in terms of the environment and marine species present. pH and temperature measurements were taken daily on the surface and on the seabed, um, and we undertook a marine species audit on the site. That was further enhanced following fieldwork uh, back in the office, where one of our team, who's got a marine biology uh, background, was able to actually go through the videos and, and double-check what we'd seen. But the rapid assessment will provide a baseline for monitoring the site in future years. Over 32 different marine life species were spotted on the site. Um, however, we think it's likely there'll have been many more. Recording the marine species present might seem sort of strange to me as an archaeologist in some ways, but marine species really are a good un indicator for understanding climate change um, in future, as they're often really very vulnerable um, to even slight changes to their environment. We built in a large amount of public engagement into the project. Um, our team included a dedicated video production team who pulled together daily dive diaries. It's too short in time today for me to be able to show you any of those. We have got some on the stand outside, but have a look at them on the Cherish website because I, I think they're a really nice outcome of the project. We also undertook visits to local primary schools um, and spoke to all the juniors, getting them excited about the underwater cultural heritage that, that is around them and um, when we hosted a video visit by Channel 4 News which was part of a wider piece on the work of the Cherish project. Finally we took along our Heritage Hive outreach trailer you can see it here it was a really popular focal point to work and as a sort of project manager for MSDS the last thing I want is my divers sat around when they're not diving if we've got bad weather or anything but they were able to go into the Heritage Hive trailer and actually work in a different way by talking to sort of the community who came to find out what we were doing. So our 2021 visit uh, is the end of our involvement with the site for now. It's certainly one we would love to be able to do more work on in future, and there's lots more to be done. It would be brilliant to go back and look at mystery rings, but I'd also like to go back at the start of the year when there is less marine growth to have a look at the site. Um, I've been absolutely delighted recently. Dutton Divers are a local dive shop based at Impefelli, and they've got in contact with us um, to ask for our help and support in applying for a licence under the Protection of Rex Act for them to be able to go back and survey the site. And they're hoping that through our sort of um, support, they'll be able to go back and repeat those photo photos. And they're hoping they'll be able to go back two or three times a year, which I think is a really nice legacy for the project. Finally, I just want to say thank you very quickly to everyone who's helped us um, during the project, especially Claire Lancaster at Cherish, who's been brilliant, and to Ian Cundy, um, who is an archaeologist who's been working on the site for many years and who has helped us 
with our work greatly. If you'd like to find out more about the wreck, then do go and visit the museum in Barmouth, but also go and watch our dive diaries, because I think they're quite good. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Well, to keep, try and keep us on time, I'm going to move straight on to Edward Pollard, who's going to, from the Discovery Program, who's uh, going to be talking to us about uh, rope access and promontory talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, um, we, we originally kind of um, were, were hoping to do like another excavation on, on the um, on, on the promontory forts here of of, of, um, of the Copper Coast of County Waterford, but um, but due, due to um, uh, due, due to COVID, we kind of restricted our, our we tried to make more of our remaining resources, and so we we, we tried tried this new this, this this technique that the um, the, the Welsh had or our Welsh colleagues had already um, uh, used it distinctly over in uh, over over there. Um, so, so, so you, you'll find that the promontory forts ha, have come up quite a lot um, in, in, our, in our findings we, 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 with Cherish, and you see that's part of, part of the, the areas that we've been working, the, 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 the headlands and the islands, like very famously the Dunbeg uh, promontory fort um, in the top left up there. And, um, and uh, you'll find there's quite, quite different varieties of, of, of these with, um, with, with, with stone walls. Um, some have got more than one, one ditch, and, um, ditch and bank on embankments. Um, along the coast, along the coast, uh, along the coast, protruding into the coast. Um, yeah. So, and the art, it, it was nice that, that it kind of linked um, Ireland and Wales together with, with, um, with, with, with these kind of features. Um, uh, yes, but they, they are do seem to be much more, more in, international as well, going all the way from Shetland um, through, through, down through, uh, down through ar around Ireland um, to Brittany and to even on to, to northwest Spain. Um, so, so, so one of the initial things, uh, initial su su surveys, we're working with Toby, we, we, and we, we, we recorded so the um, promontory forts there along the Copper Coast, where we were flying along the coast, we were taking a lot of the pictures there, and um, we were uh, certainly, uh, we've seen the banks of the ditches, uh, which were, here you can see the eroding banks, and there seems to be a lot of erosion, so we wanted to do much more work here on the, on the, on the, on, on, on the Waterford Coast. And it was interesting to see that um, sometimes you get the hut sites on the offshore, offshore, off, offshore, offshore, on the, on the uh, offshore, into, inshore, inshore island. So it does suggest that they were once, um, once connected together to a much larger feature when, 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 they were, when they were actually used. So what, what we're trying to interpret today, you have to kind of see what, what exactly were they like uh, when they were actually um, uh, being, being used. So, so be trained as, um, as, 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 a as a rope rescue operator, we were trained at the um, at NACE, NACE fire station, and uh, we get go doing um, go, 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 the climbing and then coming back down, and then with that we kind of followed that up with training over in um, in, in Dolky Quarry, and uh, sites. And um, yeah, so we can. So, so when we actually moved to the site, we need we need proper proper anchors for, for, to put to attack to to secure us. So sometimes we would use the gorse bushes or the, or the winds bushes, and, uh, but other times if there's none of them are available, we're, we're driving um, anchors here, but Paul is driving anchors into the, um, in, into the, into the cliff edge, or we were, if we're able to drive up close to the cliff, we can use the wheels of, of our vehicles to, to anchor us up the cliff. Uh, one well, of the first sites that I, I'll talk about is the, is the Woodstone Promontory Fort near, near, near Anstein on the, on, the, um, on the Copper Coast. See the promontory fort there, and um, certainly you can see the uh, the the erosion that's happened uh, during the project. You can see it in, in July 2019 there on the left, and um, there was certainly was a collapse that was reported to us in February of of, of, of 2021, and um, you can see that's which, which much more exposed um, in the banks and the ditches there of of the embankments of this double double um, uh, double bank pro, double embankment promontory fort. So we we, we secure the. Um, uh, but Paul, Paul, who trained us there, who supervised us, and um, uh, to, to secure, to secure the ropes, so make us go over, go over the, in, in, in those areas. And you can see us doing the photogrammetry, um, where we take um, to, to put all the pictures together. And uh, once we go over the cliff, and also do some um, uh, sketching and, and note taking of, of of the area that we can see of the exposure. 
Uh, so, some areas you can see, see bits of overhang, that's the, um, uh, the, the, the PT top, top layer in the ditch, so we, probably had to, we couldn't really go over that because that, that would fall down and, and collapse enough, so we went to we move more to the side of that um, to record that area and on the other side of, of, of the overhang. And, um, so over, the, over the, the, the double bank and ditches there of, of, of that, um, of that promontory fort went over like at least uh, at least f f five times in, in that area, and um, it's interesting to see that um, there was there was a clay layer that we, we got close, like like Westrop in the early in the early um, early 20th century, um, he recorded that as a splinter layer. When we actually looked at it, it was a, it was actually pure white clay, and um, that brought up because um, that, that similar kind of la um, layer seemed to be found in, in the Welsh sites as well. It seems we actually we originally thought it was a, maybe like there might, might have been a lake there, but it actually did seem to be part of the actual construction because it seemed to be appearing in in, um, in in banks. And so once you started looking for it, you find it in other in other promontory forts as well. So it did seem to link us with with forts over in Wales, um, la 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 Larry Bain on the um, on the, on the North Antrim coast, and um, there's a similar kind of construction that that is going on in, in, in these forts. That Itself. And um, yeah, we're trying, we're doing different areas and wanted to see has the erosion gone to this area as well, where there does seem to be um, more and more banks. So, was how, how much erosion has occurred and are those two, were those two originally, originally linked about um, 80 meters away? Uh, so we'll also be over the cliff. You can actually we even, we even f find some artifacts. You'll see in the future if you're able to do an excavation, probably find um, um, more of these. You see on the um, uh, on the right there, there's a very rounded stone, and um, the similarly again more links to with, with Wales. Where they've been finding um, uh, the slingshot stones, which are um, associated with some of these forts and, and hill forts as well, which um, seem to be finding uh, uh, over here in Ireland as well. And uh, we also find some, so a struck bit of flint as well. Uh, so so put, put the, that, that's the model there for, so for photogrammetry, but from the UAV. So we do, I added that as well. So we were able to kind of, with our notes and, um, and sections, we were able to draw the double bank and, 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 and ditch areas of the embankments to get our stratigraphy. You can see the inner and the outer bank. So this tied in with Patrick and Sarah's um, uh, coring that they did into, or did, uh, link that in as well. So here we can see that I've marked the two clay layers. The outer bank, we got about two meters of core. The inner bank, we got three meters of core. Uh, the ditch, we got, we got about, about what, what, one meter. And it was, we got um, even the char charcoal there at the base of the ditch was dated to, to, to AD 38, just, 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 um, just below the, um, uh, the screen there. And you can see where I've marked the clay layers as well, showing, the, showing where the, um, the, 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 the banks would have, would have been above. That's the start of the bank. And um, so the photogrammetry there is showing you the, the um, where, the, where that is, the outer bank, the, um, the clay layer, the, the inner ditch, I think. And so for, well, that's an area that we sampled uh, we were over with when we went over the cliff. And so and that, that has a little, little bit of, um, of, um, of, of, of charcoal as well from the, um, from the flotation. And that was dated to 285 BC. So we're certainly seeing a very Iron Age date for the origin of, these, um, of the bank and the ditches that made, that made, that made this a promontory fort. Uh, the other site we looked at on the Copper Coast is the Alona Brick Promontory Fort. Um, that's the island of the O'Bricks and was meant to be um, a, a more, of a, more of a kind of a capital area of the, the people, a ruling family of this area. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the embankments have disappeared, have been eroded away completely. Um, but um, there has been collapse, as you can see there in the picture, of, uh, between when, when we started in 2019, showing this, this, this area is eroding. It's an area of, um, of silver and... Uh, and, and, and lead mining, certainly in the 18th, 19th century. And here's the, um, uh, we, we tried to get onto the, uh, onto the island itself where there is, um, there's hut sites, but it, um, I think um, Paul said he wanted to set up ropes, but he needed more, more people. So that's hopefully something in the future we can have a look at um, th th those areas. But we looked in the area of the banks and the ditches. We couldn't quite see them, but certainly perhaps within the forts we did get um, uh, th th three layers of stratigraphy that we were then uh, work worked off in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the labs in, in, in Aberystwyth for the with X-ray fluorescence, and here we can um, uh, examine the um, examine what, what the what the elements are in, in, inside this um, in, in that's coming out of this um, promontory fort. So this is it's all the periodic table 
of, um, that, that find the parts per million that we're getting within, within the context. The context one, two, and three were from that um, Ballynara, the, the, the embankment area of the um, promontory fort. And it was very interesting, the results of the amount of lead that we got from that area. Three is the higher, higher layer that's um, um, of, um, uh, of, of the, 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 the most recent layer that's possibly associated with the 18th, 19th century. And, um, and even had, just out the screen, there's 1,095 of, this, of the sulfur as well. So perhaps that's to do with um, smelting and, and actually the, the lead mining. Didn't find any silver, which was a bit... Um, copper is quite low, but it's outside of more of the copper area, um, or, or, or the copper mining area of the promontory fort. So it does look like this technique could be good, um, certainly for applying for more promontory forts um, in, in other areas of, the, of, the, of, of this mining area of the Copper Coast. It's interesting that that's the more recent layer. These actually are ones below 558. So there is significant amounts of lead in, in, the, in, those, um, in, in those contexts at, at Ballynara. It's possibly suggesting, and uh, we didn't get any dates for that area, it's possibly suggesting that the, the, the tradition of um, the, the exploitation of, of lead does extend much further back in time uh, the, 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 than the 18th, 19th century. Thank you. Yeah, so just to summarize here, we can see um, that it's been quite, quite effective for, for, for studying the stratigraphy and the artifacts, and we've we collected the samples for the, for the dating. And um, so we're, add, we're adding further information to, to what, what we've been talking about in the coring and the geophysics and, and, the, and the modeling. So uh, it's certainly the differences in, in opinion, and I, I do like the similarities we're seeing in these forts and um, maritime traditions um, between, between Ireland and Wales. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. <coughs> so we have, a, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Um, and I've, I don't know whether you, uh, I've got some questions here, but um, do you want to ask the question, Hugh? I'll put the question. Um, yeah, uh, so the first question comes in from Colin Dunlop. Um, what size was the excavated hut at Ferter's Promontory Fort? Yeah, uh, what size was it? Yeah, so it was about six by five meters. Um, and then the next question comes in from Neil Jackman. Um, as promontory forts occur in quite a few countries, uh, do we know if they share similar chronology or is there a big variance even within ind individual countries? We, we, we have quite a large variance in Ireland alone um, from the late Bronze Age dated right up to the early medieval period. Um, quite a number of international promontory forts um, tend to be Iron Age, especially if you look at some of the Welsh examples. But um, Ted, do you want to say anything else on? Uh, the, the, ones, the ones I've certainly seen, um, I think, from I think maybe Scotland over to, to Ireland, do seem to be used into the early medieval period. And uh, but it's like, like, like Dolky as well, it's meant to be 6th century, a lot of the ones, maybe for Dunbeg is 6th century, but you, you use later into the 10th, 11th century. Yeah, so it was interesting to see that the one in, um, in, uh, in, in Waterford directly ties us, you know, with, 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 with the Welsh, yep, and, yeah, but something like, something like Tintagel there in Cornwall are, are later maybe tie in with the Dolky one, you know, in, into the early medieval period. And um, later ones certainly have the castles built on top, like Ferreters and... Um, yeah, maybe Dunluce Castle built on these. these. Okay, okay, thanks. Actually, so if we pause there, when I stare into the midst, has anybody got their hand up? So, we, uh, Cleo, if you can, I think we've got a couple of questions. One right at <coughs> the back there. It's hard to see who's out there, isn't it? Uh, just a question stemming from the Promontory Ford excavation and then over into the rope access. Was the erosion data used to assist in the selection of the area to be excavated? Um, you also mentioned some site safety aspects about going too close to the edge. So is there any link up between the ropes access part of Cherish and developing an excavation methodology that's appropriate for those at-risk areas with workers' safety and concern? Uh, well, well, we would have um, done our done our health health and safe safe safety assessments, risk assessments. Um, certainly, uh, 
we, 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 saw, we saw the support was also supported, um, as the support that we had above, above the cliff would have, would, have, would have supported us, and you know, and they, they would have had ropes, ropes as well, so anybody getting close to the cliff was going to be um, uh, uh, supported if you were, you know, when you get close. Sorry, Thanks. it probably wasn't clear enough. Just for future work, out of the work coming from the excavation work done on top of the promontory fort, plus the ropes access work that you've done, are you developing a methodology, a guidance document that would assist other excavators going on in the future on best practices to excavate at the edges where those material remains are most at risk? Is that something that Cherish is working towards, or we have included in our best practice a section on the on the rope access? Okay, okay if we can go to the, I think there's a question, and yeah, just there, yeah, quick. Ah, oh, this is lovely uh, work on the site. Where does the marble come from? Oh, where was the boat going to and from? It, it was Carrara, Carrara marble, so it was coming from sort of Italy. We don't know where it was going to, and we, we, we don't know, is the honest answer. There's lots of theories that it might have been going to sort of help build St. Paul's Cathedral and got blown off course. I'm not sure I believe that. It could have been going to Liverpool. It could have been coming up to Dublin, but the honest answer is, is, is that information isn't necessarily known at the moment. Well, just there's a last wreck from a Hollyhead to Dublin, which was a, had a cargo of classical art and sculpture being brought by... Um, James Caulfield, Lord Charlemagne's brother, when he was built, he built the Merino here to house his past classical collection. And it sank, his brother was drowned. But that boat is out there somewhere, so we are down again, have a look. But it's a f fabulous <laughs> site, just tremendous. Yeah. Wonderful project, thank you. Okay, um, I'm, I'm actually gonna ask a question myself to Sarah, because uh, I don't think we've had questions specifically for Sarah. Um, so in the, at the end, you talked about how the work that you've done has, has kind of potentially got value in terms of future adaptation and how we, how we manage in the future. So obviously the, the, that kind of historical record that you've got demonstrates that there's kind of, yes, there is kind of incremental change, but there's also kind of some kind of dramatic changes that within the record. And how do you think we can use that to understand the future resilience or otherwise of, of those kind of coastal systems, is it? Yeah, I think, I think there's different ways in which we can, we can use this information. So, um, so for example, at Tlin Mylog, um, we have what um, is now a freshwater lake and it's got a high conservation value. In the future, that is likely to become marine again and it has been marine in the past. So I think there's, there's some thoughts there about what we might be adapting to and what kinds of environments we might want to think are going to be important for the natural heritage in, in the future. I think in terms of communities, we found that talking about the longer term perspectives of climate change with, um, and, uh, through a heritage lens has been quite a helpful way of opening up some quite difficult conversations about what might be lost and how things might change and perhaps is a is, is a route in to, to talking about, about those difficult issues in a, in a space that isn't necessarily directly impacting on those populations at the moment. So I think there's, there's, some, there's some thought to be given to how that narrative can, can help foster those conversations which are often could be quite adversarial and, and, and could be very difficult for communities who are threatened with with sea level change in the future but I think also there's a story of resilience there from past communities who have lived in environments that have been changing rapidly experienced extremes and okay they've had to move and they've had to change but they have persisted in different ways and that perhaps gives us a, a hopeful story of, of how we can adapt in the future great okay I'm just going to do a final uh, any final questions from the audience can't see any with any hope. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask Sarah about the 540 um, date of sand inundation in Llyn Coron. Can it be linked to the late antique Little Ice Age? That's an interesting one. I think that's the obvious um, connection that we would make. I think um, there's certainly a lot going on around that time. Um, thinking in terms of causal mechanisms, I. 
that the, the, the term the late antique little ice age is, is a relatively new one that, that, that sort of emerged from, from some of the paleoenvironmental work. And I think one of the dangers of that sometimes is that we look to make those, those connections and find the common cause. And I think one of the things that we've realised with the work of, of, that we've done on different sites is that there are, there are localised differences as well. So I think that's something that obviously we're going to look into, but... Um, I'm, I'm not going to nail my colours to the mast at the moment. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sarah. So uh, I'm going to go back to Hugh. Uh, is there a final question there? Um, I think we'll just go to the uh, results of the poll. Yeah, if you, if you, if you, yeah. Okay, let's go for the uh, the Slido answer then. Yeah. So the question that was asked was: According to Climate Ireland, sea levels rose around the Irish coast are predicted to rise by how many metres by 2100? So the answer was 0 0.43 to 0 0.84 metres, and the winner is Kit Ackland. Congratulations. Well done, Kate. And uh, just want to finally thank, I don't want to hold you from your, your lunch. So first, first of all, I want to just thank all the four speakers for excellent presentations. And I uh, hope you have a good lunch. But I should m remind you to be back here for 1.45. So we are starting again then. And also, just a further reminder that obviously, as well as having your lunch, there is the... Uh, the cherished exhibition, and obviously the stands outside uh, for you to view during the, during the lunch hour. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>